the next panel is on opportunities for academic research. The moderator is uh, Chris Chitty, and we have uh, five panelists, uh, Drew Pavora from Shell, Amy Herhold from ExxonMobil, Shafiq Jaffa from Total Energies. We have Leora Dresselhaus away from Stanford and Matt Cannon from Stanford. So I'm just gonna turn it over to, to Chris to um, run the panel. Uh, good, good, um, good morning, I guess. Um, this is uh, Chris Chidsey from Stanford University. Um, just want to check in with Richard. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. You sound great. Great, great. Um, okay, well, so what we want to look now in our last panel is at opportunities for academic research. Um, and this would focus more on longer term uh, places where we can um, identify um, you know, what are the major obstacles to even deeper decarbonization than, than some of the things we've heard about so far? Um, we want to identify the opportunities for research um, in science and engineering uh, that will go to maybe longer term, but, but as I said, deeper decarbonization. Um, and uh, specifically, we're uh, we've got a mixture of academic and industrial speakers today. Um, and we want to look at, you know, where are the specific needs uh, by industry that could really be addressed by uh, long term uh, research opportunities at the academic level. Um, and um, then I think that the key question is, where does innovation really make a big impact? And uh, of course, that's uh, crystal ball gazing, but I think it's important to, to kind of give it a shot. So that's where we're going to finish off the conference today. And um, with that, um, we have five, um, excuse me, we have five um, uh, panelists, so we're going to move along fairly quickly, and I, I'm sorry to the panelists, but I'm going to need to to, to kind of keep you to some fairly strict time limits here. Um, our first uh, panelist is Amy Herhold. Uh, she's a senior advisor um, for uh, research corporate strategy at ExxonMobil, technology and engineering company. Um, Amy is... Um, uh, like myself, a uh, PhD in chemistry, which of course is always uh, nice to see when you're doing uh, basic, asking questions about basic research. Um, and she's been at Exxon throughout her, her career um, in 20 years in a, in a wide variety of research areas. Uh, but um, it, for uh, the last several years, she's been the uh, Director of Physics and Mathematical Sciences uh, for Corporate Strategic Research at Exxon, and, with, and I think that provides a really good perspective on how we can um, look for the longer term opportunities. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Amy. All right, thank you. Now let me share, I just have a couple slides here to frame, uh, frame the discussion. And all right, am I in the right view? Yes. You guys see the projected view, okay. Good. Yes. So, uh, so thanks for the chance to participate on this panel. It's been a pretty exciting three days, um, <clears throat> and I'm I'm going to frame the big picture on what some of the key research opportunities are. Um, and but before I do that, I actually want to talk a little bit about also how we go about the research because I think that's going to be important, especially as folks start to develop um, ideas um, for new research opportunities. And you know, and that's if you look at the, you know, over the last couple of days, right? I think everyone's gotten the picture that you know the scale of what is needed for industrial carbonization is enormous, and um, also that uh, the it's a very complex system with a lot of uh, different needs, and so <clears throat> it's important to think about how we collaborate in the space to to be able to go faster, and so you know, and this collaboration I think needs to be university. Um, national lab and industry. And um, the, there's, there's uh, three kind of key factors I want to emphasize um, to think about. And, you know, re academic research, the longer range research is really all the way over on the left in the discovery phase, but you need to stay, have some line of sight to where you're going. And uh, so three factors to think about. One is very interdisciplinary problem, you know, challenge for every, uh, you know, for every discipline and um, chemists and beyond. Uh, and, uh, and I think what's great actually about pre-court and the new school coming with Stanford um, is that's kind of a way to do interdisciplinary research on steroids. So please take advantage of that. Um, another key challenge is whether ideas can scale. 
And, and we have a lot of, you scale in a lot of ways, um, but scale here, you know, there's the scale of the industry and of the gigaton CO2 challenge. Um, but here I'm talking about the scale as a verb. How do you go from lab scale up to, to field scale? And, you know, when you're doing, developing a new process, sometimes it's not obvious what are the killer variables, scientific challenges that might come later. And so I think if we want to accelerate here, we need, there's an opportunity to collaborate with industry and with national labs to help assess what are some of those killer variables and tackle them earlier. And the last is the, you know, the need for a system view. And I was so excited to hear Jewel talk about that yesterday. So completely agree that that's important, whether that's the process, whether that's the plant view or the whole integrated supply chain or value chain. And I think it's important for two reasons. One is you need to be aware of, of the ramifications of making a change in one part and how that can affect others, sometimes negatively, right? If you reduce, you know, if you use less heat in one area, um, you may have been using that waste heat to heat something else, right? So you need to look at that bigger picture. But I think the system view is also important for the opportunity, because if you look back, you know, rather than trying to optimize just one part of the process, it's really important to look at the whole system to understand where, you know, where are the opportunities where I can skip steps or, you know, use fewer pots and pans. So key things to think about for collaboration. So let me just frame the, the research opportunities. Um, and I think we've had lots of really great discussion on all of these throughout the workshop. Um, so <clears throat> first, I, you know, if we're, we're gonna go for electrification, which is a really important option and gives us lots of new tricks. Um, and uh, so definitely an area to, you know, that I think is, uh, there's a lot of excitement there. As we've been talking about and was emphasized again this morning, um, <clears throat> you know, we really need to keep, increase the reliability of the electrical supply. Um, you know, with renewables coming in, especially if we want, you know, low carbon intensity power. And so, um, you know, key way to do that, right, is the medium, is, is energy storage, um, which could be, I think, in particular, medium to long duration storage. And, um, in, you know, electric, elect, you know, doing that with uh, electrons is a key thing. We had a really good discussion this morning on heat, uh, which is a pretty uh, exciting area that's emerging. Um, and so lots of work needs to go on there. And then I think also modeling the grid to understand what that looks like and help us make choices, um, which is, you know, what's the scale of that demand? Um, where should things be placed? Where should the infrastructure go? Um, and, and also this industrial demand, you know, it's going to be a lot if we really want to electrify and how that couples in with, you know, transportation, electrification, which has been a big focus um, recently. And so, and so I know NREL and others have been doing this, and I think there's more that needs to be done. Then the next question is, once we have the electrons, how do we best use them? Um, and I think, you know, lots of discussion uh, throughout the, the three days. Um, one area that I want to highlight, because highlight, I think it's a real uh, you know, longer term challenge is how do we better use and generate high temperature heat, you know, 850C and above um, with electrification. And just to give a little, little concept of scale, physical scale now, that photo is a steam cracker being installed at our Singapore chemical plant and uh, so it's several years back. So you can see the physical size of it. And that's one of 16. Um, and so not only are these, you know, is, is a high electricity demand if we're going to heat with the electricity, but also it's um, high throughput. So, you know, the products are going through very quickly. And so it's a high flux need. And so, uh, you know, I know the talks this morning outlined a lot of different options. Um, and I think that's a really key area for research. One thing that I don't know if it came up earlier, but I think my panel partners may, may bring it up as well is, you know, there's if for power conversion um, and power supplies, there's an a, there's an opportunity, I believe, to increase the efficiency of the power conversion um, equipment as well and control. Um, because if it's like 70 to 80 percent efficient today, you know that's a that can be a big issue when you really have a high amount of electricity. Um, and last on this part is just you know there's also the opportunity for newer processes that have lower energy intensity and i think the real prize here is newer processes that also not only lower the energy intensity but give us something else give us better products give us more selectivity um, as a big opportunity and uh you know so advanced separations for example to you know separate molecules by membranes instead of heat um, and again you got to look at the system view make sure you're 
you know, you're not breaking something somewhere else, but lots of fun there. Last thing on this and, uh, uh, is that the, um, the, the top, the bottom part is the new part, you know, the novel process. The top part is the retrofit. Um, I think while academia usually wants to focus and not myself, as I recall, right, on the new future futuristic process part, um, the retrofit is so important given the asset base and the long asset lifetime. And if we really wanna decarbonize, we're gonna have to be able to do that as well. Last part on the, the right is just, it's not just electrification. I think we've heard that throughout all of the talks. Um, I won't go into details because I think we've had a lot of discussion and, um, uh, and you know, we can talk more. Um, I just think, you know, and I'll just put out there, there's a lot of interesting things about hydrogen. I know we've had a lot of discussion about whether or not it makes sense. Um, and of course you have to look at regionally where you are. There may be areas where hydrogen makes sense. And I think as a question is, can we do something with hydrogen beyond, um, you know, putting it in a burner and, um, you know, uh, putting it in a fuel cell? So an open challenge, I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's a, you know, there's some interesting white space there. So with that, I will look forward to the discussion. Great, well, thank you very much, Amy. Um, and now um, with that kind of broad uh, introduction to where maybe addressing my question of, you know, what does is, what is industry need? Um, I, I'm gonna turn it over to my academic colleague, Matt Kanan from chemistry at Stanford. Uh, Matt is an associate professor of chemistry um, he's also the director of the Tomcat Center for uh, Sustainable Energy. His research focuses on novel processes to use CO2 as a feedstock uh, for fuels and, and other areas as well, uh, maybe, uh, but that's most relevant to this, this conference. And um, he has a strong interest in the commercialization of innovations from, from the academic sector. He's done some of this himself and is with his, his, his own lab mates or lab, lab uh, members. And, and he, more importantly, I think, has really driven Tomcat to be a center for, um, for commercialization of academic innovations within Stanford. And I think that's a, a very major contribution. Uh, Matt, uh, take it away. Terrific. Uh, thanks. thanks so much, Chris. It's great to be um, on this panel. I, I have a couple of cartoons really to share if, um, if it's helpful. Let me do this. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to focus um, my comments on um, electrifying and decarbonizing uh, liquid fuels and chemicals. Okay, so sort of a subset of the scope of topics that, that Amy introduced. Um, just to sort of set it up uh, at, at the outset, why do I think this is, you know, particularly uh, important? Uh, oil is, you know, something like 30% of, of energy supply right now, um, and, and even though there's great progress in electrifying light vehicles, um, nearly all projections indicate increasing demand for liquid fuels going forward in the next few decades. And that's you know, driven largely by commerce, by heavy shipping, aviation, um, and then the production of, of consumer goods. So I would argue that, that it is a large unsolved problem in the, in the decarbonation, um, decarbonization space. Um, you know, what do we do about about all of these carbon products that we rely on and will increasingly rely on as global population grows and, and the economy develops. Um, and I, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on, on using biology. Um, I, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but, but basically, you know, biofuels, um, bio-based chemicals, they're limited by, you know, a, a very low efficiency of natural photosynthesis. So I think there's, there's tremendous opportunity to harness um, synthetic systems, take CO2, water, and renewable power as the input, and, and generate um, fuels and chemicals um, and beyond. Uh, you know, Chris asked to identify, you know, what, what are the key sort of back to basics questions that uh, academia can, can focus on? Um, and, and I, I think the challenge is that th there is no one set or, you know, one small number of of particular questions or problems because there are so many pathways. Um, so what I'm showing here is, is basically, you know, in cartoon fashion, you have, you have inputs of CO2 and water and renewable power. Um, you have to have some electrolysis, okay, water, water electrolysis or CO2 electrolysis. I'll talk a little bit more about the, the choices there in a minute. Um, and then typically can have a downstream processing, either thermal catalysis or uh, microbial 
transformation to turn that into your final products. Um, we've talked a lot about fuels and chemicals. There's a great session on refining and chemicals uh, yesterday, moderated by Mateo. Um, I'll put it out there that you can also make food um, or food ingredients, I should say. Um, this, is, this is an area of increasing interest and also one that it can have a huge impact on sustainability because of the inefficiencies of, of the current uh, food production system. Um, so I, I think the key research areas, I resonate with Amy on this, re, uh, really clarifying and, and benchmarking the, the pathways that are available now and their, their impact. That is far from trivial. And I think that requires a lot of collaboration between academia and industry. Um, and then from that framework, identifying the opportunities for process intensification. That could be a new reactor design. Um, that, that can be a, a, a new catalyst, but, but all of those insights have to be um, gathered in light of what is the overall, uh, what is the overall process and pathway look like? Um, and then of course in, in academia, particularly in chemistry, you know, we like to try to enable new transformations and you know, develop catalysts that, that catalyze reactions that just really weren't possible or were very inefficient before. Um, those can then open up new pathways, um, but again, those have to be sort of analyzed from the systems level to, to realize how they can impact the big picture. Um, and then finally, I, I, I think, you know, as these systems scale and hopefully succeed, um, you want to be able to, to do minimal processing of CO2. You want to use CO2 really as a waste stream and not as a, um, not as a highly purified chemical. Um, so just one thing I want to I want to point out on this upfront choice of the electrolysis. Um, so I would argue that that we're possibly at a <laughs> inflection point for water electrolysis, um, and so it, projects you know announced recently amount to hundreds of gigawatts. It's actually almost impossible to find up to date information because these numbers are changing so rapidly, um, and it is about three orders of magnitude larger than the installed capacity today. Undoubtedly, there's some noise in all these announcements, but uh, there's a huge opportunity to leverage hydrogen plus CO2 to go to fuels and chemicals. And I think that's gonna become increasingly important. Um, if you wanna do the, the transformation directly on CO2, um, you can take CO2 to CO at high temperature systems. Um, and then there's been a, a tremendous amount of effort to develop uh, low temperature systems for doing this although uh, they're currently sort of stuck at, at low efficiency and low current density. And finally, the future is really, can I take CO2 electrochemically to some product that would you know, normally take several steps through other routes? Um, this is really tantalizing, um, but again, there's, there's major sort of fundamental um, obstacles to, to overcoming this. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm just about uh, running out of time here, but yeah, I, I just want to reemphasize these, these messages that um, the opportunities really have to be identified in the context of the of the whole system that that, that one is looking for. So. Thank you, Matt, um, and particularly for kind of highlighting, um, you know, where we can go with with CO two utilization and and the the different pathways you've you've uh, articulated for getting started on that. Obviously, just to to intermediates that then go on to more. Uh, more developed products, carbon-carbon uh, carbon bonds, and so forth. But I think it's really important to kind of highlight the the importance of the water electrolysis pathway versus the various CO2 electrolysis pathways. So thank you for that. Um, and now we're going to turn um, to another academic colleague of mine, um, Leora Dresselhaus Maris, um, who is an assistant professor in material science and engineering, and uh, by courtesy in, in mechanical engineering. Um, notably, she also, it's like the, the first four of us on this panel are chemists. I'm very excited by that, uh, has a, um, a PhD in physical chemistry from MIT. Um, her work has um, of late focused on the study and imaging of defects and dislocations in materials, particularly in metals. And, and it's in this context that she's going to, to help us look at the opportunities in, in iron making and, and um, in the steel industry broadly. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Leora. Thank you, Chris. Um, just to make sure that I'm on track here, uh, how many minutes do I have? Well, um, we're working on five, but I've got 20 for my discussion with you, which I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of because um, I think already everybody's going to take a little bit more than five. It's uh, five people. It's a lot. Please take it away. I'll, I'll interrupt you when you are going on too long. 
Perfect. Well, thank you all so much. Um, and thank you, Chris, for, for your introduction. Um, so uh, I, I kind of come at this problem of, of investigating um, steelmaking and, and uh, looking towards how we can utilize new advances in science and optics and in uh, physics and, um, and in, in chemistry towards um, finding opportunities to rethink how we've done these kind of historically older processes within metallurgy. Um, primarily, I've been focusing on, on manufacturing and um, beneficiation. So that's the extraction of the ores um, from ores out of the earth into uh, metal feedstocks that we can use in the subsequent steps. And what we find in this industry is that really there's a lot of um, quite antiquated approaches that um, you know, we're, we're making big strides in, in moving forward with approaches to decarbonization, but the gigaton scale is really challenging to uh, come up with new strategies towards. So um, what I prepared here is a little bit of a case study looking um, at how that manifests in the steel industry specifically um, with a little bit of my work that I might skip through uh, now that I see the time limit. So um, steel is ubiquitous across our society. Um, it is one of the most essential materials in the modern world. In fact, even you know, the quality of life in a country is evaluated based on the consumption of steel. However, if we start to look at um, the emissions that, that comes out of that, we see that actually total emissions globally uh, each year um, across every single sector, including environmental emissions, uh, amount to 8% coming from steel. So um, the challenge, of course, is that that is today, but steel demand is increasing exponentially as um, modernization and, and societal progress continues to evolve. So how does this work? I'll, I'll uh, speed through this quickly, that uh, we start with the mining and extraction, then we have to crush and pelletize, uh, make that into iron, alloy it into steel, cast it, and then process it. So this is a multi-step process, each of which are very large-scale processes. And when we look at how that's man that manifests in industry, we see that there's kind of three basic types here. There's the basic oxygen steel making, which makes up about um, uh, two-thirds of the market share today. Um, there's direct uh, reduced iron and arc furnace, which makes up about 5%. And then there's the recycled steel, which is uh, the largest progress towards decarbonization. Although as uh, Chris Pistorius mentioned yesterday, there are some challenges in the sustainability of this approach because of um, copper, uh, copper impurities and other types of things like this. When you look down at the energy intensity, you can see that, you know, Steel making uh, via the recycling approach has massive advantages, but the blast furnace isn't doing so bad, this basic oxygen steel making. However, in uh, beneficiation, you, you always have to take that with a grain of salt. That carbon footprint is really not just a discussion of the energy footprint, but also of the native emissions from the process itself. And when you look at this, you see that actually uh, the iron making in that blast furnace accounts for about 50% of the carbon emissions from uh, today's steelmaking process across all the different types of technology today, um, even though it was not necessarily that bad in terms of the energy consumption. So we have some work to do thinking towards how to reinvent this process um, and to look towards the chemical approaches in the long term. Um, so strategies to decarbonize iron making kind of fall into three primary categories um, that really uh, are based on, on the infrastructure costs and translation required to get from the lab scale into this large scale at the gigaton scale. So we have things that you know, we could implement and actually are working to implement today, reducing the, the carbon footprint in the current infrastructure. There's things like top gas recycling, direct iron reduction with syngases uh, that looks towards natural gas, which is significantly cleaner than coal, um, and, and things like the recycling industry. But, but we also have kind of new directions that are starting to build here. We have direct iron reduction with gray hydrogen, which is much cheaper, but um, still comes with some uh, scalability challenges. 
We have uh, things going towards biomass blast furnaces and uh, carbon capture. And then we have these longer term approaches that we can see kind of new technologies that can enable a truly carbon zero version of steel making, but that don't actually really enable uh, or that, that aren't really scalable on, on, on the five to 10 year term and therefore aren't the only approaches that we can do. So no one solution, as, as a lot of people have said in this workshop, no one solution is enough for the urgent time scale of climate change. Um, we really need to be working in all these areas. Um, I prepared a little case study on, on the green hydrogen direct iron reduction. Should I go into this, Chris, or should I? Yeah, please give us give us a, a slide or two on this. Okay, so um, the general approach here is, is if you look at blast furnace, uh, the blast furnace as we have it today, uh, or sorry, basic oxygen steel making as we have it today, what you can see is that this entire process Really, the, the lion's share of, of the emissions come from this blast furnace, as I mentioned before. Um, this hybrid technology is, is the um, current kind of carbon zero um, approach that is uh, working on the pilot scale right now. And you can see you go down in orders of magnitude in carbon reduction or carbon emissions. However, this has not yet been demonstrated as a scalable approach. So you can ask yourself, well, why is that? Um, as we look into this, we can see that the blast furnace, um, as we start to reduce this and we replace the coal with the hydrogen, it now changes the reactor design as the coal in the blast furnace was the thing that actually created the mechanical stability of this furnace. Um, meaning that we now need to lower the temperature, giving us efficiency, but making it a much more complicated process to map. Um, so, in the long term, we now have to shift from thinking about these established blast furnaces to new approaches that we can do for this low temperature, much more efficient version of steel making. But this requires a lot of fundamental science to be able to scale this process. So you can look towards this chemical pathway, but it's not quite as simple as, as chemical steps here, because as you start to scale up this process, you see unexpected changes and, and incomplete uh, chemistry that arises from the fact that as you reduce the system, the volume of the system changes by 46%, meaning that you now start to have these, um, this interplay between um, a reaction moving forward, but also um, thermal uh, transformations, change to the kinetics and to the mass transport as the material starts to crack from the reaction as it goes. So in my group, we've done a lot of work starting to zoom in on what this chemistry goes as. And we've uh, looked at kind of industrial systems and, and built up model systems to be able to understand the kinetics as they pertain to these um, unusual driving forces that we're not used to thinking about at this industrial scale. And we've been able to demonstrate that we have a surrogate system that really can map out these representative kinetics, although it shows differences that we're working on understanding now. And we can demonstrate how they're, you know, at this low te temperature and now different types of chemical mechanisms that are at play that are starting to compete with each other, changing the uh, performance and efficiency of the, of the whole process. But we can go a step further than that. In fact, we've been able to demonstrate that at the macroscopic scale, we can see these interrelated mechanisms based on the rates. Um, but as we zoom in on the micro scale, we can see that actually uh, the crystallographic facets that I have uh, shown here in different colors all react at different rates and show different kinetics, which as we start to zoom in further and further, we eventually see turns into a microstructural evolution that can uh, mitigate the efficiency and performance of the reaction. So we can think of this as a shrinking core model, but this is really what it looks like because we have this volume contraction that is totally transforming these, these particles as they're reacting. And we've been able to now map this out and map out how the size scales of this process uh, transition from 10 nanometers all the way through micron scale uh, particles. And we can directly watch that as it happens to start to build this and compile this into these models. So now we can ask ourselves, well, uh, you know, how, do, how does this type of a, of a kinetic model translate to, uh, that's really at lab scale, translate to this type of, of reactor scale model or, or understanding of this gigaton, gigaton scale uh, technology. 
Well, to translate science from the process or the, the science in the lab to the process at scale, we have to start with model systems like this that allow us to understand the fundamentals that drive the system. And we have to be able to measure and model the kinetics that dominate the process. And then we have to go a step further. We have to be able to implement those types of models, reducing dimensionality in different types of ways that we now start to have access to with AI um, technology. And we can start to build these types of reactor scale models. So now we have a reactor scale model and we can start to demonstrate uh, the ability to scale this type of a process. And now the next step becomes uh, demonstrating with techno-economic analysis the appropriate trade-offs we need to be thinking of to be able to understand the cost-benefit analysis of which scientific questions are even worth answering. And then finally, we need to have opportunities to be able to build these types of pilot scale reactors at different levels of pilot scales to demonstrate that we can get to a gigaton. So what does this mean? I mean, the, the take home message that I, I send here is that this takes a long time. And so this type of early stage long-term solution must still be prioritized today for us to in hundred years be fully carbon zero. Um, and so uh, with that, I will uh, turn this back to Chris. Thank you for letting me talk on a little bit longer. Um, I hope that uh, this helps to spur discussions of kind of a case study on exploring um, how to actually translate the science this way. Thank, thank you very much, Leora. And I think it's, while it did take a little more time and, and same with Matt, I think what's, what's nice about both of your examples is it shows how in the long term, we may be able to reduce the temperatures of many of these key transformations, obviously by using, um, in, in both cases, I think, a, electrolytic processes to get to a key intermediates, um, in both cases, potentially hydrogen, um, but then be able to do things at, at lower temperatures, but that requires new science. So, so I, I really appreciate that perspective. Um, with that, we're going to turn back to our industrial participants to get a kind of a, 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 a closing out of how we kind of close the loop on, um, on going from, from the lab to, to innovation to, to implementation. Uh, but now looking at the longer term, at the collaborative kinds of things that um, Amy was speaking about in, in her presentation. So um, Dhruva uh, Aurora is leading Shell's effort to integrate renewable generation and storage um, of electricity for desired power quality um, within, within the petrochemical industry. And it, he has previously worked in a variety of Shell's R&D projects. Um, from catalysis to CO2 utilization, corrosion management, many other areas. And, and he now turn, has turned his attention uh, to this critical question of electrification. So I wanna hand it over to him to, for his remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Chris. And uh, can, you, can you hear me all right? Yes, you're coming through clearly. Okay, thanks. Uh, so first of all, it's, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Yeah, it's an honor to be uh, listening to um, all the impressive discussion that, that we've had in past uh, uh, two days and this morning as well. And I must say, I'm very, um, it, it goes back to, to Arun's remark that this is a gigaton, uh, this is a giga scale problem. And this is a giga scale effort that is needed in, in the next few decades to come. Um, and while this is very daunting, I believe this is the, this is the right time as well. And this is the right time to one, use the uh, electricity to, uh, to electrify the processes such that we can decarbonize what we are industrial processes, but also start thinking about alternative uses of electricity um, in ways that we have not thought, uh, thought this through. And specifically, um, without getting into all the discussion that has happened, um, yeah, and all the avenues in which we can uh, in which we can approach. I would like to propose two areas, yeah, uh, which which I'm very passionate about, and we are we are focusing on this as well. And um, these are these are longer term um, research topics to be to be thinking through. Um, the first one is what I call as the uh, we are pivoted by the Bunsen burner in in the in looking at the chemistries. Um, 
So the first topic is essentially to think about processes which leverage the electricity. So these are electrically or electricity leveraged uh, processes to be thought about. Um, electricity, as we know, is a, is a higher quality um, uh, of energy. And yes, while you, utilizing electricity to as an alternative to all the sources of heat that we have been using in the past is an important task in near term that needs to be utilized or that needs to be met with, um, uh, uh, with the off the shelf technologies that we have and a few other technologies to come. We really need to be thinking about how can we utilize electricity in various other ways, utilizing, um, and, and there are two uh, aspects of this. One is utilizing the higher quality of electricity for process intensification. And the second one is using the abundance of electricity for, for novel uh, chemistries that we, that we um, that essentially were economically unviable because of the higher prices of energy. Uh, uh, the first one being um, the higher quality of, um, utilizing the higher quality of electricity for process intensification. What I mean by that is that utilizing microwaves, utilizing uh, plasma, utilizing electric fields, magnetic fields, uh, electrically charged uh, uh, surfaces, catalysts, and so on, to come up with the processes which, uh, which can explore a much wider range of, uh, of process conditions, pressure, temperature, uh, uh, these, these process conditions which were not, uh, we, we were not capable of uh, thinking in the, uh, in the conventional days. This also uh, leads us to um, not thinking about scale up, but even scaling down. So, so not pivoted by our conventional ways of thinking. It can be thought about micro reactors uh, where uh, some, some of these uh, chemistries would then become a lot more viable. So that is a long-term uh, research area. Uh, that is one. The other is on the abundance of um, uh, of electricity that is going to be available as well. So as it has been mentioned in several places that yes, we can bring the PVs um, online. Yes, we can bring wind energy online, but to be able to connect them to the grid is, is a challenge as well. However, if there are industrial processes that can utilize these bespoke uh, uh, generation assets, then they can be used in utilizing intermittent power but abundantly available to generate uh, products. So again, thinking about that way, how electricity is generated into the chemical processes. Uh, essentially in this whole um, uh, space, we would be thinking about higher quality electricity and uh, novel processes and putting them together. So a multidisciplinary approach between the chemical engineers, uh, chemistry department and the, and the traditional EEs uh, looking into, into the space together. Um, the second area is really about, um, we have had electricity for a long time, but we are still learning how to utilize electricity. Yeah? Uh, so when I, what I mean by that is that uh, the power conversion systems, which need to be now interacting or uh, which we can utilize to enhance the molecular processes, interaction processes, is something that we um, need to be uh, operating at that frequency as well. So the power conditioning systems, which are, which are then utilizing higher power quality and higher power uh, intensity is something that we need to be researching upon. Uh, these are conventional um, power converters, uh, uh, um, power electronics. Uh, they, they need to be researched um, uh, the battery management systems, the, the battery storage systems, and so on, they all need to be, um, need to be looked upon as a, a, an area which requires not just research right now, but a continued research for decades to come. So those are two areas that I would, I would like to propose in this basket of all the other um, uh, ways to look at. And I reiterate them here, uh, the, the first one being, uh, being the electrical power leveraged processes. And the second one being an efficient power conditioning system that we should be thinking about for the for the decades to come. Yeah, with that, back to you, Chris. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Druva. Um, and that was useful to get us a, a perspective on where we really need to, to look long term uh, and where academia can focus on needs that actually uh, are going to make a difference. And, and I think in both of those cases, those needs are, are across industries. It's not just in the petroleum and chemical sector. Um, and then finally, for our, our, our final uh, presenter today, um, we have uh, Shafiq Jaffer, who is the VP for Total's Corporate Science and Technology uh, division in, and uh, projects in North America. And he is uh, focused on building a long lasting relationship uh, with academia, startup companies, and the private uh, research companies. And so in many ways, it's just uh, perfect for have him have, to have him finish this off with a kind of a perspective on how we bring this all back together, maybe, uh, you know, kind of closing off uh, some of the things that, that Amy opened up for us. Um, and of course, I I, I hope he will uh, take us even beyond that. But uh, um, Shafiq, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. Um, I wanted to kind of uh, group my thinking into a few different buckets. I, I kind of went back through the three days and uh, start first, perhaps first with uh, Rune's talk and kind of some of the things we heard also uh, from the speakers uh, just in this session today, uh, very similar comments is that you know, when we're looking at still pulling a lot of carbon out of the ground, right? Uh, Matt, you mentioned this, we're still having fuel, oil demands, chemical demands, and that carbon ends up in the atmosphere or in the environment eventually. And that end of life is a big question mark always for me is kind of what are we really going to do with this? Um, so one of the key things here is that the reduce, reuse, recycle we heard about from Arun is really critical, but also we have to think about the waste streams as a feedstock now. Right? You mentioned CO2 as a waste being a feedstock, but we have to think much broader than that. We talk about plastics recycling and that, but you know, we need to think much broader in terms of everything that we're producing coming out of our uh, refineries and chemicals plants, what's going to be the end of life uh, strategy to really bring that back and close the carbon cycle fully. Right, And this is a big question mark still on the table, I think, um, that we're just nibbling at the, the heels of still. Uh, fuels uh, obviously is the uh, gorilla in the room, but that's uh, you know I think we have uh, a number of things we got to go after there. But you know the CO two as a waste stream, not as a pure stream, coming into our plants is a big one, and so we have to think very differently about how we uh, look at our feedstocks going forward. The second thing there is also substitution of materials. Um, there are, you mentioned uh, you know how far we still are from the steel substitution and. Uh, and cement is very similar that trying to find solutions that are going to facilitate the quality of life for the rest of the world to have the, the quality of life of infrastructure we have in the Western developed countries is not viable with the carbon budget we have. No way, no chance. It's a dead end street. This means we have to significantly reduce the cement and steel we use in our infrastructure. And this means that we have to bring in uh, substitutions, the polymer composites, the wood, that Arun mentioned, but also in terms of architectural design, we have to reach out into what is the basic needs and think about new designs for architecture, for infrastructure. We have to bring in ways to bring um, leverage how to take advantage of ground heating and cooling because the thermal load is a major challenge we have for decarbonization, for heating and cooling of homes, buildings, commercial, et cetera. And so we have to think about really what is that investment upfront from the short term versus the long term to really bring down the carbon footprint of you know all our infrastructure and our buildings and that we didn't speak about that much because we're talking about industrial but in general you know we supply the fuels in that for all these uh, these buildings and that we have to think about how we're going to work with our customers to really reduce their footprints. Um, again. Back to this kind of uh, tying it back to last year's seminars around uh, carbon management a little bit. We spoke a lot uh, over the three days about kind of closing the, the cycles, which is really flattening the curve. But we have to have a more holistic thinking about how we're actually going to get to a reduction of CO2 in the atmosphere. And direct air capture, we haven't spoken about much to, uh, here. Uh, Matt, you, you mentioned it about CO2 as a waste stream being pulled. But you know, when we're talking about trying to work with dilute streams of CO2 with direct air capture, it's a major uphill battle still we're very far from. And I think we have to think a little bit more uh, synergistically with nature inspired solutions here. 
and how are we going to think about really taking advantage of starting to reduce the, the carbon in the atmosphere, not just, okay, we're focused on our own little world of trying to flatten the curves of our scope one, two emissions, but really, what are we really going to do from a synergistic standpoint to bring down the, the CO2 in the atmosphere? The other one that I, I, I note here is uh, scale. One of the things that, uh, you know, our previous uh, session to us spoke about this a little bit, but when I look at a refinery for us, typical size, you know, you're talking about tens to hundreds of square kilometers of land area needed to power, whether it be solar or wind. And today in Europe, I don't know if many of you are following, there's a lot of pushback uh, due to NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard. There's a lot of people saying, yeah, I want solar, I want wind. And then when you talk about, okay, it's going to be here, it's going to be here, here's all the electrical lines that have to go in. Uh, no, thank you, we don't want it, right? Can't you put up uh, something else? Can't you put it elsewhere? And so surprisingly, nuclear is back on the table and even in countries that didn't even want to talk about it uh, last year, which is Germany, Sweden, Norway, they're all talking about potential use of nuclear to augment uh, uh, this challenge of NIMBY issues that they're having, right? So I think this is, again, uh, one of the key things that we have to think about is that land area's uh, demand is huge and how we think about where and how we're going to deploy renewables to power or retrofit our existing infrastructure, existing industrial sites is still a major challenge uh, going forward. It's not going to be a straightforward answer. There's gonna be a lot of resistance, I think from the local and regional. And that brings me to the next point, which is we have to think about co-benefits. So what is it in it for the local communities? What is it in, in it for the regional communities that is going to help them understand the value, not only for the decarbonization of the industrial sector, but what other benefits does it bring for them beyond just the short-term jobs in construction, right? How can you facilitate the integration for heat, for example, for the cities or the towns? Switzerland has done this, I would say, fairly well compared to most countries, but it's a small country, relatively short distances, et cetera. But can this be broadly applicable? So we need to think about kind of more co-benefits in terms of how we think about our strategies to de uh, decarbonize our industry such that the regional and local communities are really with us uh, hand in hand. The, the other one that uh, Amy, you mentioned, as well as uh, Matt and others, uh, and uh, Drew has mentioned is this systems thinking. You know, if we took a blank piece of paper and rethought about our industry and how you would meet the consumer demand, customer demand for the chemicals and fuels, let me just put this out there. The next 3 billion people are going to be in the continent of Africa. It's so one and a half billion, it's gonna be four and a half billion by 2100. We have an opportunity to do something very different, very new, trying to take advantage of really that growing market to do something in a very different way than we've ever done before. If we continue to copy what we do in the Western uh, countries, what we've done, you know, it's a dead end street, we're done. We have to rethink the opportunity from a systems level, from a um, standpoint of how the markets are going to be developed, the business is going to be developed, and then how does the industry really meet those demands? in a new way for that continent. And I think this is a big one that's facing us in, in a tremendous way that uh, doesn't get enough thinking. Uh, at least in total, finally, I've started to see a lot more thinking about in terms of how to drive uh, the business development in Africa in different ways than just uh, let's copy and paste what we've done in the past. So this is still early days. And I think this is a big opportunity for the globe to and the, the academics really to uh, to work towards. And the last one that I'll just point out here that at least in terms of the US as an example, I'll point, but it's pretty much all the Western countries, uh, developed countries is that the long-term energy storage, we cycle 4,000 billion cubic feet of natural gas between summer and winter. 4,000 billion cubic feet, one kilo of, hydro, of uh, natural gas is 15,000 watt hours of, of energy. And substituting that with solar, wind, and some form of storage, whether it be hydrogen or uh, some kind of hydrogen carrier, this is a massive, massive challenge. I mean, we can do all the great things of the world, but if we can't solve the seasonal energy storage problem, there's no way we solve the carbon problem. And so when we look at hydrogen, you know, there's a lot of issues still uh, facing us here, whether it be blue hydrogen and CCS and scale that we've already spoken a bit about, you talk about green hydrogen, we're back to the land area, or even simple things like storage and transport. We don't have good solutions for hydrogen today. 
right? Transport in pipelines still is a lot of question marks. Storage underground, whether it be salt caverns or in uh, depleted oil gas reservoirs, still many questions to be resolved. So there's no ubiquitous solution here. There's no silver bullet on seasonal energy storage. And I, I would point to, I think this is a major, major challenge that uh, we need significantly much more research uh, deployed towards. So hopefully I, I keep the time and Chris, uh, if we can have a good discussion. Thank you very much. Um, Safiq, uh, that was, it was great. And it, it really broadened the, opened up the, the discussion. Uh, particularly, I, I, I really want to come back. I mean, obviously, this last point about storage is, is going to be critical. But I want to come back to uh, something you said just before that, which is that um, there are new markets coming on. And, and, you know, from a humanitarian point of view, you really want that to be the case. You want to in, 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 encourage and, in, and, and improve the quality of life uh, elsewhere on the globe. And frankly, if we don't, uh, other problems come up. So I, I think it's, um, it's really a great opportunity to think about, uh, I'll just use the, the old trope of the cell phone, how much the cell phone changed the way telecommunications works uh, and, and the fact that you know, it, it came in and it didn't even have to displace a, an old technology. It just came in new in large parts of the world. And I think something similar may, may be what you're pointing to. So I think that's a really interesting thing to keep in mind as new markets open up. However, I want to bring us all back to, um, you know, the sort of opportunities for um, um, uh, basic science and engineering in the academic context. And so I have a, a kind of couple, I think, three areas that I'd, I'd like to highlight. And, and I want to start with something that, that perhaps is, is almost back to, um, to our previous panel. Uh, but but maybe a little more advanced than that. And, and that's a question, I'll, I'll put it this way. What processes can be redesigned or the, de, or the processes improved, um, maybe fundamentally redesigned, such that you get a pure CO2 stream that makes it easier to do things like uh, Matt and, and, and others have talked about of, of carbon capture and utilization or if necessary, carbon capture and storage. Um, and, and I'm particularly focused on CO2 here, but I think there are other waste streams that, that might be uh, important. Um, methane is another one that, that you might think of in this terms. How do you design a process so that if you're going to have a waste stream, it's really a high value waste stream and not something that's highly dilute and gonna cost you a ton of money uh, to, to, bene to beneficiate. Um, and so I'm gonna actually start um, with this one by, by um, I think we'll start in the same order as the speakers and we'll mix the order up for, for future questions, but, but maybe I could have Amy uh, see whether she has some comments on this idea of, of higher quality CO2 streams. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just start with, of course, in obvious places with oxy combustion. So using, you know, not just, um, you know, using oxygen or enriched air as, uh, you know, to, to do that. And so I think that that's, you know, people, a lot of people are exploring that, and I think that's an important avenue to, to look at. And I'll, I'll just add the, you know, there's the, in addition to the, um, you know, changing the, uh, the, the CO2 concentration, which is you're talking about, which, you know, makes it more valuable for, for carbon capture and storage. But I mean, you also have the issue of a distributed, right? I mean, some plants have a lot of very uh, distributed, lots of different um, CO2 sources. So how to handle that is another challenge. But Anyway, oxy combustion is a good, good place to think about. Great. Okay, so we'll put oxy combustion on the table, um, and and with that, I think I'm going to turn it to Matt. This is obviously key to your concept of of how to use CO2. How do you get good CO2 streams? Sure. Well, so I think it's important to remember in the short term, um, there are good sources on the on the megaton scale, you know, from from ethanol fermentation plants and from some uh, reforming plants as well. So so it shouldn't be viewed as an impediment to new CO2 utilization technologies today. The question is, as those scale and hopefully create more demand for CO2 as a feedstock, what's going to move in to, to take the place? And I, I, I mean, certainly think ultimately it, it has to be uh, direct air capture. Um, and, and I think the opportunities are, you, you know, can the process that uses the CO2, I mean, maybe turn it around on you, Chris, and say, can the process that uses the CO2 can we relax the constraints on that? This really gets to sort of the, the catalyst, you know, whether it's synthetic or, or biological. Can we relax the constraints on that so we don't need 
you know, four nines CO2 coming into the, coming into the process. And so mm -hmm. it's a, I, I think, you know, the two have to meet kind of somewhere in the middle, but, but yeah, ultimately mm -hmm. the source has to be the air. That's not an impediment on the, on the several year horizon. If, if you have a great process that there are good sources today. Yeah, no, I, I think short, short term, we have plenty of CO2 in the marketplace, but longer term, I think we will find it's dirty CO2. And I, and obviously if the process can handle that, that's, that's fantastic. Um, though I think some processes may need uh, to clean it up or not want to process such high volumes of dilute CO2. Um, I, I want to uh, kind of point to the, uh, the cement and steel industry, which produce intrinsically large process uh, emissions and, and turn it to Leora and ask, you know, are there ways to get those, those get higher quality CO2 out of one or both of those processes? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and I would say it, it's something that in the steel and cement industries, and I'm going to loop in now uh, the critical materials world, um, where with rare earth element extractions, um, we think about this a lot because the rare earths come out in carbon, mostly in carbonatite type ligands, where we also are generating, I think it's uh, 12 tons of CO2 per ton of a rare earth. So we think a lot about, um, I really liked what Drew was saying about finding new ways of coupling energy, going from electricity to atoms that have heat or atoms in excited states. That there's been a lot of efforts in these industries to think towards those lines. Um, so th there's that approach to it. And, and I would say the electric arc furnace has, has made very large strides in that and being able to use plasma-based uh, plasma chemistry to be able to rethink how we're, we're processing this type of reaction. Um, there's some recent work that's come out, um, coming up with new ideas to think towards um, hydrogen-based plasmas, how we can uh, do kind of a one-pot version of both steel or iron reduction and steel making. Um, and so there's some really interesting things coming out on the horizons towards that. Um, and a lot of it comes back down in answer to your question, Chris, to how are we liberating the CO2 in this process and which is the step that we can use to get rid of that. Um, Europe has had this top gas recycling program that um, started in, I believe, 2004 that has been quite successful in finding ways of extracting out the hydrogen um, and carbon monoxide and gases in the steelmaking process that were, are simply unreacted, um, but are still exhausted so that we can at least purify the waste streams to refeed in the pieces of the waste streams that are still reactive gases. Um, but you know that purifies the CO2, but you still have the problem of the CO2 streams, uh, which kind of gets back to Shafiq's comment. Um, I would say, uh, I think that covers everything. Perfect. <laughs> OK. Great, great. Um, and, and with that, I, I guess I'll, I'll go back to, um, to Dhruva. Um, would you like to take a shot at this with respect to you know, the quality of the CO2 stream that's going into various processes or could go into future processes? Yeah, so, so um, uh, with respect to the CO2, um, there are point sources of CO2 that would be, that would be um, and, and coming from Qatar, so, I'm, so where I was based in my previous assignment, we have the largest gas to liquids plant in Qatar. And over there, you can find a really pure sources of CO2, specifically in the process where we are taking the natural gas and we are creating syn gas out of it. And there would be CO2 sources that uh, point sources that you can really tap into. So um, as we start looking into areas where um, uh, where we can uh, utilize the CO2, and this goes back to CCUS, right? So it's a utilization and the sequestration part. The dirty sources can be sequestered, but the pure sources of CO2 should be utilized for, uh, uh, for any kind of reaction. And they will be bespoke reactions as well, because what is that purity of CO2 is something that uh, it may be mixed with hydrogen, and that's a perfect combination for a, for a reaction which goes back to taking that and uh, making syn gas out of it, or it may be mixed with something else that you can utilize as well. Yeah, uh, getting into a methanol or an ethanol or a higher alcohol kind of uh, chemistry. Um, now, 
that is that is one aspect. The other, of course, is as I was pointing out here, yeah, how would we utilize electricity in a completely different way? Not just thinking about the heating applications. And I would point out to one of the review papers that we wrote last year with Texas A&M, um, which is on um, a, a novel reactor. And we are, like, we are utilizing the internal combustion engine as, uh, as a reactor now. Yeah, so powered by an electrical um, uh, energy that uh, internal combustion engine can then be looked as as a small reactor. And when I look at the pressure and temperature conditions that we can reach inside an internal combustion engine, which was a combustion engine in the past, now it's a reactor engine, you can see areas which are completely uh, unheard of in terms of the, the both in, the, in terms of the time and the pressure and the temperature that can be reached. And what kind of chemistries are going to be possible there, we haven't even explored. So that was, uh, those are the two points that I would, I would say. One is of course, uh, every CO2, uh, source that we can look at has a certain purity that can either be sequestered or utilized in a, in a certain chemistry. So the chemistry has to be um, ad adapted to the source as well. And uh, the second being, yeah, uh, that chemistry does not need to be limited with everything that we have right now, but thinking about chemistries of the future that can utilize electrical power in a very different way. Very nice, thank you. Um... I, I just want to um, mention to those who may be interested, um, if you put your questions in the chat, I will, I will try to get to them in the next several minutes. I, I want to turn now to a, uh, and maybe we'll do this more as a lightning round, to, um, to a question um, which has been on my mind for a very long time, which is, you know, it's great to store electrical energy as electricity in a battery or as heat in a, in a heat storage device, but can you store it cost effectively as intermediates uh, for the step, you know, using the steps that that you can afford uh, to make intermediate, and and a couple of things that just come to mind are if we're going to make methan, we're going to make hydrogen in, with an intermittent process um, because the electricity is intermittent. Um, could you go all the way to methanol, and um, and or or could there be innovations and in catalysts that allowed you to get all the way to methanol, um, as as or other intermediates, maybe not methanol. Um, as as a as a as a higher value stored product, um, and one that might be easier to store than hydrogen. Um, and and another example of this would be because of the high heat flux necessary to make um, lime from calcium carbonate. Is that a case where you know okay sure it's a lot of heat, but you're going to have to apply that heat really quick and in large volumes anyway. Maybe it doesn't matter if you only do it for a third of the day. And you turn it off. Now I'm I'm no uh, chemical engineer, and so this may all be very naive. But I'd love people's thoughts on the idea of actually storing beneficial intermediates rather than trying to build a separate storage process, which has all the complexities of of storing um, either electricity or heat or 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 even hydrogen as a gas. Um, when maybe you could just store something that you're going to use later anyway. Um, so uh, for this one, uh, let's let's take it in in reverse order and do it really as a lightning round. Just one idea of something where you think there might be an opportunity or not. Maybe I'm crazy, and capex will always stop you from doing what I'm talking about. Um, so let me let me take it in reverse order and go to Sh Shafiq first, and 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 then back through the the, the protocol. Shafiq. Yeah, just a very quick comment on this. I mean, we're looking at methanol and ammonia as well as many others. And formic acid and others that can be hydrogen carriers and that. The big issue here is you have to look at from end to end the system level efficiencies. Every time you touch and do any kind of transformation, you're taking a hit in the efficiencies. And there's a big demonstration now between Asia and the Middle East on ammonia. And it's going to be very interesting to understand kind of what kind of efficiencies they're really able to get across the entire, the entire chain. And that's the issue is it depends where you're taking it to what you're going to do with it at the end or how you're getting your materials at the beginning. And each kind of supply chain there is going to be unique. So the efficiencies really are going to be um, what limit you. And so it's not going to be a ubiquitous solution that this is used for every single problem. And so I think that's a big part of it is that every time you look at it for a specific case, you can't generalize it. And so you got to kind of think about it very much again at the local regional aspects of where it fits right for the right problem. So there's no single answer here, in my view. Okay, okay. Um, and um, 
let's uh, let's just uh, thank you. Let's just keep going here. Um, Druva, uh, uh, Druv. Yeah. So th thanks. Um, and I and I think um, uh, somebody mentioned this in the in the in the talk, uh, which was uh, which was a fantastic comment that electric uh, the energy transition can be also thought about the energy digitalization. And energy digitalization, what I mean by that is as that every uh, every unit of electricity counts. Uh, how would you utilize that? And you can utilize this in uh, you can definitely store this in in an intermittent way, or you can even store this in products, and it can be as simple as a farmer uh, getting the uh, utilizing the pump and making sure that the water is stored that they can be that they can use it. Uh, to uh, to irrigate the field, um, so th those kind of storage is also that energy utilization. Uh, so mm -hmm. when the intermittent the intermittent nature of the renewable energy will definitely lead to that intermediates uh, part, yeah, uh, and that those intermediates can be not just chemical but all sorts of products that you can utilize. So I totally yeah. agree with uh, with that way of storing energy. Okay, uh, thanks, but just to keep things moving, Leora. That's a really interesting question. And I'm gonna answer this question with a scientist's kind of picture on this, that um, in metallurgy, uh, we often talk about this type of storage of energy in, in crystal plasticity, which is the science behind storing defects inside of metals to shape them. Um, so we can think about basically the distortions in a material as little point sources of energy that we have stored there that if we heat up the material and anneal it, um, will liberate that out, or energy back for us to use later in the form of heat or however else we decide to use it. Um, so I think that these approaches do exist. I heard people in the previous session talking about uh, phase transition materials, um, using phase transitions to be able to serve as um, a type of intermediate. Uh, and, and so I think that these absolutely do exist. Uh, this, this comment is maybe not directed to steel or cement, um, but, but it's a really interesting perspective. Thank you. Matt. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I think I'm, I'm aligned with, with Shafiq on this one. So, uh, so, so first of all, on, on the electrolysis capacity factor, um, I, I think you can use batteries to buffer it. So, so you want the, you're gonna size the electrolyzer to run 24 seven, you're gonna buffer the renewables with batteries, my understanding is that this is this is what's done in sort of the large scale hydrogen storage projects in the U.S. Um, and then, if you um, you know if you're going to take the hydrogen and CO two and make a make a product, I think you, you really want to make something that's not not storage to go back to electricity, but something that's going to displace a hard to decarbonize product um, in some other sector. You know, be it transportation or, or, or chemicals. I, I think it's just gonna be too hard to compete with, with other forms of electric energy storage. Um, if, you're, if you're thinking of, of a product as a, as a um, it's going to a product and, and back uh, for-, for Oh, I didn't mean back. I just meant to build it up over some some cycle of intermittency, some some utilization cycle, but yeah. So, so I take I, your point that batteries may, may- Yeah, yeah. I think the batteries have advanced that it's compatible with Making hydrogen and then doing, you know, be it hy hydrogen to methanol, or um, uh, you know, some more elaborate process to get to gasoline or diesel or, mm -hmm. or whatnot. Okay. I, I think those are compatible. All right. So you're taking the alternative perspective, which is batteries are really just going to solve that problem for us, at least at the chemical transformation level. Yes. Uh, and and finally, I, I'll turn it to Amy. What are your thoughts on this question of of intermittency and how it's best stored, or energy is best stored? So. I mean, I'll agree with everybody else that there's no single solution, but I think it's, uh, I guess what I would say it's worth looking at. And I think you need to, to sit back and again, look at the, the system view and look for the opportunity. I think the, um, uh, I think there's a lot of fun to have in this space. Um, I guess the, you know, the challenge is also depends on the process in which you do it, right? If it's an electrochemistry process, for example, um, how do you scale that up? Um, and address some of the, you know, the fundamental challenges. So bottom line is, I think that's worth looking at. And I think uh, a system view allows you to look and look for synergies that you didn't think of. Um, and that's going to probably vary regionally, as everyone has pointed out. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, thank you. And then to, to, to round us out, we have a question from the audience. Uh, Andreas, um, I'm wondering if you can be unmuted to go ahead and ask your question. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Andreas Mazakos. I work with Shell. I was glad to see Dhruv and, and the rest of the distinguished panelists uh, present the to topic. I thought uh, one of the problems we discussed is, of course, for R&D is the availability of adequate and proximal renewable energy or low carbon energy. And one thing that we haven't talked a lot about is the transmission of electricity in, in, or not low carbon electricity from areas that have abundant uh, supply and probably they're uh, curtailing it because they don't know what to use it to areas that need a lot of it and don't have it. And there may be a lot of, a lot of uh, technologies that may be uh, able to develop to transmit it thousands of miles away. So I, I think here the question really is, um, are there basic academic research areas where we really haven't we haven't taken full advantage of the opportunities. Obviously, there's policy issues, as we heard a lot in the last session around the grid, but there's also just the question of whether the grid could be done differently. Any, any thoughts on, on getting electricity around uh, to, from places where it's abundant, to places where it's needed? Anyone want to chime Can, in here, Amy? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add that, um, you know, there uh, people, you know, I mean, there's certainly probably ideas on novel transmission lines. I just, I think the going back to kind of what I was trying to point out that the uh, we have to think about modeling the grid and what the choices are right because you may I mean you know you may want to um, you know look at what that infrastructure build would look like and what it will buy you and or whether you go to other options in um, places where you don't have renewables um, you know natural gas would come up, uh, CCS and so I think um, I think the the kind of overall system modeling is going to be important to help assess options mm -hmm. Okay, well, back to the integrated uh, perspective. And with that, I think we are, um, you know, a few minutes over and I want to thank our panelists for um, really great presentations. Thank you for providing kind of the, the long term bigger picture of where we might go to, to get at uh, this huge challenge. And, um, and um, hopefully it's inspired some of uh, the folks on, 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 on the call to, um, to come up with great new ideas and 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 I'm, I'm sure they'll be bringing them to matt to help him ask for his help in commercializing them at the uh, tomcat center um and with that thank you all very much for your participation and i will turn this back over to to richard